propose a toast to the first day of school. Which is helping me to have time to make videos. And it will help me to get to the temple more often, but... Oh, gotta go check and see if that's somebody honking for me. cab honking for my neighbors. Alright. Now, here's where this video idea came from. It's a book review. But more than a book review. <laughs> On Facebook, I uh, fairly recently put up um, a new story that points out one proof against evolution. And a family member defended evolution. But towards the end of a, a very long back and forth, I found out the family member thinks evolution could not happen without God making it happen. And that God used it. But I wasn't Oh, which baffles his mind. This family member should not have been against my post on Facebook pointing a weakness in evolution because this family member should have given it a thumbs up because the atheist evolutionists do not say it couldn't have happened without God. The science textbooks that teach evolution do not say it couldn't have happened without God. They say it happened and there is no God. They <laughs> so, him, oh my goodness, this person, I, I don't understand him on this issue. Um, <clears throat> admittedly, in the middle of this discussion, I did point out some, some places that evolution leads to that aren't directly, aren't spoken by a lot of evolutionists, but they are reasonable steps, not mental gymnastics to get to. It's probably the same honk that was for my neighbors a second ago. <clears throat> um, yeah, so if you believe God used evolution and it couldn't happen without him, then Somebody denouncing the evolution is not denouncing what you believe. And if you believe that and you want evolution taught in schools, you are asking for your religion to be taught in schools. Duh! If evolution could not happen without God forcing it to happen, and you want that taught in a science classroom, you're having your theology taught there. <laughs> I don't want my theology about how things began taught in the classroom. Let's stick to the science. <clears throat> and uh, there's a great website, but maybe I'll make another video about that. But one thing this relative did is cited a letter by Henry Eyring, father of current apostle Henry B. Eyring. Henry Eyring was a great scientist back then. Now he's been died of old age for many years. An active member of the church and a well-known scientist. Maybe even well-published. I think that's one of his claims to fame is getting a lot of things published. Well, he wrote a letter to his brother, or brother-in-law, um giving his opinion about a book. And that book was Man, His Origins and Destiny by Joseph Fielding Smith, who at the time was an apostle of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Later he became the president of the church. 
Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters when it comes to Mormon theology and the way Mormons look at that book. We believe that God will not let his prophet lead us astray, but he doesn't turn us into robots, and so apostles are free to have their own opinions. Well, when this book came out, it ruffled some feathers, and the president of the church at the time, David O. McKay, made an official statement saying, this book, he didn't denounce the book, he just pointed out this book is not the church's official book. It's not published or put, pushed by the church. It's Joseph Fielding Smith's thoughts on it. He is responsible for what's in that book. Well, Henry Eyring wrote to his brother-in-law and... Let's start off with what was good about the letter. See, this is more in a book review because I'm going to give my thoughts on the letter that Henry Eyring wrote, too. Um, Henry Eyring called Joseph Fielding Smith a good man. Got to give him credit for that. All right, so the letter wasn't complete crap. <laughs> but Henry Eyring, his very short summary of the book was that it was written by a good man and I think he gave it some kind of credit for having some spiritual truths but it was marred by bad science marred by bad science first let me give you my review of Henry Eyring's letter Henry Eyring's letter was written by a, a good guy a nice guy a man who had faith in the Lord and was a, uh, stuck with his membership in the church. But his letter was marred by bad science. <clears throat> you see, because science is... Scientists should be skeptical of outrageous claims. Um, like, I know how old that rock is, even though there's no age etched on it. <laughs> you know, now if somebody says, I know how old that car is... You can know how old the car is, um, assuming it's not, you know, a custom-made car, because cars change if throughout the years how they look, and so you can know what year a car was made. And there are vehicle identification numbers. You can really know what day a car was made, or what year. <clears throat> but um, Henry Iron wrote in his letter with great certainty that we can know how old the earth is, how old the rocks are. But the rocks don't have dates etched on them. <laughs> his, his letter made it sound like, you know, we should just be able to look at the rock and know how old it is. And anyone who doubts the most famous geologist on it is, you know, is crazy. <sighs> Um, the radiometric clocks uh, Henry Eyring wrote about. Now, virtually nobody, I gotta throw that word virtually in there, because out of the billions of people on this earth, there's probably somebody who says that mass spectrometers are fraud, and, but virtually nobody, um, you know, the people that run the big museums, the people that have big creation science ministries, um, the people at the Discovery Institute or who are strictly into science and don't let their religious beliefs cloud their judgment. They, um, they do not claim that we don't, can't know how much uranium, how much thorium, how much, which kind of uranium is there. But the people who say, I can be certain about how old this rock is because there's a certain proportion of this kind of uranium to that kind of uranium. Uranium-238 to uranium-239 or 36. Or uh, there's this much lead, there's this much uranium. Or there's this much thorium, there's this much of the daughter element of thorium. Or there's this much helium, this much argon, this much potassium. Those people who claim they know what uh, how old the rock is are assuming how much of the elements it started out with. 
So there's nothing wrong with being skeptical that they know how old the rock is. Um, there is something wrong with claiming that we can't know how much uranium and lead are in the rock, or whichever other element it is. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with being skeptical that the scientists' assumptions about the rocks, starting out with pure whatever the element is based on the method, because there's more than one element and more than one method, there's nothing wrong with being skeptical that the scientists' assumptions are wrong about what percentage of lead, uranium, thorium was in the rock to begin with. <clears throat> and so that's that's why I say the letter had bad science. So man, his origins and destiny um, it was a book written by an apostle. Apostles are allowed to have their own opinions about stuff, which is why it is unethical and just generally wrong for anti-Mormons to, you know, break out Mormon doctrine when they want to prove how crazy we are or wrong we are. Mormon doctrine, despite the deceptive name, is not an official church, an official book published by the church and signed off on by a committee of apostles and prophets. Uh, it's just one apostle's understanding of things. Now, <laughs> One thing I don't understand about the, or the controversy, this happened in 1954, in case I didn't mention that yet. So, uh, I was still more than 20 years away from being born when this book came out and there was this controversy. But as far as I can tell from what I've read, the controversy about the book, Man, His Origins, and His Destiny, was what it said about evolution. I don't see what's so controversial about it. Well, he's very blunt about it. Um, but he pointed out that people are leaving the church and losing their faith in God because of evolution. And of course they are. And I'm confused by people like that family member of mine um, and a professor at BYU who's on YouTube giving speeches uh, saying that uh, evolution is compatible with the gospel or something some, something like that that uh, I disagree with, obviously, if you can't figure out from my body language and my tone of voice. Um, but uh, one fact about man's origins and his destiny, how can you call a book bad science that has extensive quotes from scientists? Sometimes entire speeches given by scientists. How's that bad science to give an extensive quote from a scientist? Um, <clears throat> Joseph Fielding Smith obviously consulted from the, what you can read in the book. He consulted with scientists about different issues. <laughs> Is it bad science to talk to a scientist who studied an issue? Spent many hours learning the details and intricacies of an issue or a subject? <sighs> um, and we can have a great confidence that um, Joseph Fielding Smith is not heretical as Latter-day Saints define it. If you think Latter-day Saints are heretical, if that's your opinion, you're entitled to it. But if you agree with Latter-day Saints, uh, or you're a Latter-day Saint, you should not call his book heretical because it has extensive quotes from the scriptures, from official letters from the First Presidency. Um, one thing I haven't thought of before, he pointed out, um, God is anthropomorphic. I knew that already, but I hadn't thought of applying that word to it. But one thing that apostatized Christianity and evolution have in common, common is denying the anthropomorphic Anthropomorphism of God. In other words, the similarity God has with man, or how manlike God is. Not in every way, but in some ways. And I do think the book does deserve some credit for, some, some criticism 
for its harshness is against Catholicism. And Catholics are right about some things and wrong about others, but I think he should not have written so-called Christianity so many times in the book. They're Christians too. That's the way I look at uh, other Christians. They're Christians too. Some of them are Christians who are going to have a rude awakening on Judgment Day. Some of them are the Christians Jesus Christ was talking about in Matthew 25, 40, where he lets us know he's going to say to some people on Judgment Day, I never knew you. People who walk up to him and say, Lord, Lord, I'm yours. Okay, that's a summary, not an exact quote. <laughs> I did all these great things in your name. I preached your name. I saved thousands of souls for you. And Jesus Christ is going to say, Yeah, I don't know you. I think here on this earth, why start arguments that we don't need to have? Why be too harsh with people? One argument I have um, for that position is look at... 3rd Nephi chapter 11, and now the Lord denounces contention. Why well, start extra contentions that we don't need to? They're Christians. Let's not call them so-called Christians. <clears throat> um, and, uh, one of the reasons that Latter-day Saints, that he pointed out in the book, should be behind the truths that are in the Bible, and not glomming on to the false religion of evolutionism, is the Book of Mormon tells us to believe the Bible. So, as well as the Bible itself, and the fact that uh, the evidence does back up the Bible, the, um, the Book of Mormon tells us to believe the Bible. <clears throat> and, alright, two other thoughts about this book. Um, one unique Latter-day Saint perspective that you point out in the book, Noah's Flood, was the Earth's baptism. That's how Latter-day Saints look at it. That's a frequently quoted by Apostles and Prophets uh, thing. <clears throat> yep, the Earth got baptized. It's going to receive the burning the way uh, our, holy, our gift of the Holy Ghost is compared with a burning, a metaphorical burning. Well, the Earth is going to receive a cleansing burning before everything's done. <clears throat> um, one thing I didn't know before I read this book, I had to get it in a PDF format. Um, it is free on the internet in a PDF format. Uh, maybe there are some old paper versions you could buy, but it's not being printed currently, to the best of my knowledge. <clears throat> in 1912, the first presidency of the church sent a letter to a mission president taking head-on the false accusation of the Adam-God theory. Now, what does that mean? Um, antagonist of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints accused Brigham Young of saying that Adam is our father in heaven and that Adam created Jesus Christ's body by having literal, physical sex the way two mortals have sex to create a body with Mary... And that when we pray, we pray to Adam, the first man on the earth. <clears throat> and this letter explains what Brigham Young was getting at in the talk that is twisted out of <laughs> and arrested to make those accusations against us. Now, <clears throat> the true understanding of Latter-day Saints about Adam is that he is literally the ancestor. In some cultures, they don't have a word for grandfather and great-grandfather. They just say, father. And in the 1800s, um, some people just use the word son or parent, daughter, father, or mother to describe their relatives even if it's a couple generations either way. For example, one quote from Wolford Woodruff in the 1800s, 
um, <clears throat> said that he was talking about something he did with his grandchild and said none of his children had out hoed him in the garden. None of his children. So he was using the word child, children, to describe a grandchild in that quote. So Brigham Young was using the word father about Adam, like to mean um, ancestor, direct ancestor, and skipping saying great, great, great many times uh, grandfather. Adam does still hold a position of authority over this earth. Now, he is subservient to Jesus Christ. He's not bossing Jesus Christ around. He's subservient to Jesus Christ. But Adam does hold a position of priesthood authority and calling over this earth. And that's one of the things Brigham Young was getting at in that speech that got twisted around to create those false accusations. Um, and those are my thoughts on man, his origins, and his destiny, and the um, letter that Henry Eyring wrote to his brother or brother-in-law about the book, Man, His Origins, and His Destiny, by Joseph Fielding Smith, published in 1954. Thank you for watching. You have a good day.